and welcome to the session of Veritas Forum. My name is Matteo Tocchetti, and I'm here at Arcada as a principal lecture. And tonight here, I'm the moderator of this session, um, which have our two guests, Peter Payne, on my right, from the United States, philosopher, doctor in philosophy, and representing the Christian side, if we can put it like that. And um, Robert Broterus, yes. uh, Finnish uh, doctor in philosophy, a licenciate in philosophy, Correct. and representing the atheist side. Um, this is Veritas Forum. Is anybody of you non familiar with this kind of initiatives? Are you all familiar with Veritas Forum? Veritas Forum, I, I would like to read the notes provided to me, um, is um, an initiative which um, started in Harvard. I read here 1992, of course I would need the glasses for that. But anyway, in 1992 in Harvard, and he moves to Finland in um, 2012, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, as I understand, the main rationale, the main goal of Veritas Forum is to facilitate dialogue between uh, Christian uh, followers, Christian believers, and everything else. Everything else, including other religions, and uh, other beliefs. Uh, I'm personally glad to participate in this initiative because I think one of the problems of our times is the, not necessarily beliefs, but the lack of dialogue between people with beliefs. To put it very simply, compared to the 70s and 80s, which was my youth then, it seems that people are not able to talk to each other anymore, no matter what they claim to believe, no matter what they uh, think life is all about and so on. And I think this is a huge problem uh, for democracy. Uh, I don't like the word tolerance because it's, engaging with diversity should not be about tolerating diversity. For me, tolerance is an insult. But uh, it is, I would say, not only for democracy but for the well-being, it is a matter of learning to engage with diversity. Diversity, biologically speaking, is what makes us survive through a um, lot of years. If we lose the capacity to intellectually engage with diversity, I mean, there, we, we become invulnerable as a species, if I can put it in biological metaphor. Having said that, um, I should bring your attention to that piece of paper in front of you, which, uh, if you check it out, will ask you some information, maybe a short um, instructions about how this is going to work out. Each of our speakers will have five minutes to introduce themselves and the main ideas, and then the, the floor will go to you. So the, the emphasis, we are not here to, to present uh, our idea or, or the idea of our guest, they are here to answer your question. And the idea of grilling uh, might not refer to barbecue, but in a way to, to challenge. <laughs> um, if, if you watch BBC, there is this hard talk um, rubric. I, I like the old ones, the new one is a bit... So I think you are invited to ask challenging questions. You know, of course, you can play the game asking each questions uh, from the opposite perspective, so that you are forcing our speakers today to, to, to uh, not to do propaganda, but to actually answer, you know, to go beyond assumption and stuff. Uh, I would also, um, I, I think we, we make this game more effective if we follow a bit of time rules. So you, you can have statement. You know, you are welcome to express your opinion, but I will kindly ask you to do it synthetically. Oh, and then of course question. And also, if you feel, because we are dealing with philosopher here, you know, it's the worst species. We have to, <laughs> if you feel the, the answering to your questions or, or the co comments or counter comments are semantically challenging, if we are speaking too difficult, if the register uh, because you might come from other disciplines and stuff like that, not because we, we, we think you're not uh, up to the thing. Please don't hesitate to, to ask. You know, so we would like you to feel comfortable and, uh, in order to prioritize understanding. So even semantic or terminological understanding, you know, it's important to that. Um, before I start, do you have any specific questions or, or something you would like to be clear? Are you aware that this will be in some form broadcasting on YouTube. I, it seems that your face will not be there, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> we will make a fool of ourselves, but of course your voice 
uh, will be there, right? So people will have access to, to your questions and give us an opportunity. Yes, please. I'm also here from the media, so if anybody, uh, I'm just asking if, if it's okay to pose your question as well with your name. Okay. And he said that, I would, leave, I would like to give the crown first to our foreign guest and, uh, and then uh, our domestic. The floor is yours. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Peter Payne. I'm from California. I have a PhD in philosophy. My dissertation was actually an overlap of philosophy, theology, and cosmology. It was basically looking at the uh, basic physical constants and asking why is it that when one looks at the basic physical constants, if they're slightly different, that uh, it seems like nothing like life would be possible. In many scenarios, complex structures are not possible, so therefore no intelligent life is possible. So I've had a strong interest in science. Uh, by temperament, I'm a skeptic. Uh, I w would like the Christian faith to be true, but at the same time, I don't believe it because I simply would like to have it be true. There are a number of reasons that I think support the Christian faith. At the same time, I don't think the reasons can dictate a conclusion that one should have. So when you study logic, there are certain premises which give you a conclusion and the truth is guaranteed. In most cases, there's pieces of evidence and they support or undercut some conclusion. They don't tell you how much. And because of that, equally intelligent people can look at the same evidence and evaluate it differently. So if someone says they can prove atheism or prove the Christian faith or show that one is more reasonable, there are arguments which are relevant, but the challenge is that when one compares evidence, there is a subjective element within it, and each person has to say, well, this is what makes most sense to me. It's very important to me that the Christian faith be reasonable, and I think I'm a person who understands pretty well what atheists think and why they think it, and I try to ask, okay, what what's lying, lies behind their question, what do I make of it? So that kind of dialogue is, is vital. When someone asks, why am I Christian? There's sort of two sides to it. One is sort of uh, what is the motivational side. Why am I Christian motivationally? And the other side of it is philosophically, why am I a Christian? Why am I a Christian? So just motivationally, uh, I spent quite a bit of time in my university years with a Christian community looking at scripture and studying scripture. And I came to love what was there. I was amazed about how you have different authors writing from different perspectives, but there was a marvelous cohesion amongst, them, amongst themselves. And the wisdom which was there was remarkable to me. Sometimes people say you can't trust the, the Bible, you can't trust the Gospels of actually being about Jesus. Uh, but in fact, uh, if, you, if you think more carefully about it, it may come up in conversation, that people who are skeptical about the Gospels basically discount anything it says and assume you shouldn't believe it unless there's exterior evidence to support it. The odd thing is they'll believe things written from non-Christian sources and accept them, and not say you don't believe them unless there's external sources. So actually when it comes to the Gospels themselves, they were all written uh, at the latest by John in the middle 90s, and they're written within time frame of not the, just the original apostles, but the people that they mentored. So it's really quite close connection to the life of Jesus, and we, one should take it, it seriously. But in terms of motivation, when I think what Jesus taught, Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus' response was, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. Uh, and he said, and he adds, the second one is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. And though Jesus said that, that all the law and the prophets hang on these two things. Well, if you're an all from sort of Western secular way of thinking, those things are crucial and vital to a Western secular way of thinking about the world. They're not things which come from reason. They're not things that come from other cultures, but nonetheless a part of a heritage or thing most of us respect. And for me, it draws me very strongly to Jesus himself. And Jesus also modeled love for other people. He modeled love for the people that were despised. He gives a parable about a story of a Samaritan. The Samaritans were despised by Jews and vice versa. And the Samaritan is actually the hero in the parable that Jesus gives. So I'm drawn to Jesus, I'm drawn to his life, drawn to his teaching. It's worth noting though that being a Christian is not principally an ethical system. Jesus, when he taught, was largely talking about himself. And the question is, who am I? If you look at the Synoptic Gospels and the Synoptic Gospels, the disciples start off hoping that he's Messiah. 
But their categories keep getting expanded. Who is this man? He's able to calm storms. He's able to forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. Who, who is he? Okay, so that, that, that sort of draws people. Uh, it, it is, it Jesus, Jesus is talking about himself. And for me, the amazing thing to me is that when I ask, what is God like? We can actually know what God is like by looking at the person of Jesus, because if Jesus is God revealed to us, that gives us a marvelous window onto God. When it comes to the philosophical uh, arguments, I'll get into more of those. But it's vitally important to me that, in fact, the Christian faith is reasonable and not just something which one would like to believe. 30 seconds. Okay. Uh, let me just add that a couple of key things in terms of why I think naturalism is false is naturalism does not give any account of human person. What is the human person? Brains, yes. Uh, behavior, yes. But it has no account whatsoever of, of feelings, of uh, emotions, of conscious thought is simply outside the radar. So it seems to me that whatever the world is like, even apart from the religious questions, one needs to ask, what is the world like? And it's clearly not just physics. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry, there's this sound I can't That's good. Stop. That's right. <laughs> just because I cannot use it, yeah. Mm. Do you know how to stop this? This is horrible. Is that your phone? It's my phone. <laughs> <laughs> Then it's Making a bit embarrassing, you know, if you cannot stop your own. No, yeah, but I, I tried, but it was stopping before. Now no, it doesn't. This is horrible. Press Silence. Press the side button to turn on. I got it. You got it. All right. Apologies for this. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, please, the yeah. floor is yours. Yeah, um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Robert, and uh, uh, I have been always, always atheist, but, you know, there's different kind of atheists. There's people who just don't happen to believe in God, whereas I would say since my teenage years, I have been very interested in discussing and researching the topic of religions and, 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 and gods and, and the culture of uh, religions and the history of religions. So I, I'm, I'm sort of more like a thinking, thinking uh, uh, discussing atheist. Uh, I studied uh, natural sciences at the Helsinki University, physics, chemistry, mathematics, and I think that gives like a good basis, you know, for, for being, being an atheist. Uh, I did some research at the Helsinki University uh, before I moved to industry and I'm working now, now as a software developer in the industry, but uh, I have been continuing this uh, hobby, hobby of uh, philosophy and atheism also in, actively in association life, so I went to, first to the Skeptics Association, to the board, and later to Free Thinkers, where I was the uh, chairman of the Finnish Free Thinkers for five years. And I have been uh, writing many articles, being in many interviews and discussions and debates uh, uh, on, on these topics during the years. I find it an interesting and nice hobby. Uh, I'm atheist uh, because I have been coming to the conclusion that it's very unlikely that gods or in fact any supernatural things exist. Uh, it seems to me that they are more likely to be this kind of uh, cultural creations of, of, of humans. Not impossible, but just unlikely in the same way as uh, dragons and unicorns and ghosts are unlikely. Uh, this can be compared to people who believe because they want to believe or people who believe because they chose to follow Jesus. This kind of thinking is foreign to my, my mind. I, I simply believe what I come to believe based on evidence and, and, and logic. Now, uh, about my views, I will not tell more details, but I will give you some hints what you can ask questions about. So you can ask about history of religions, how there are so many religions, uh, the history of Christianity, history of the universe from the Big Bang, history of life and evolution. You can ask me about Christianity, like the Christian God salvation plan for humans, what I think about Bible and reliable Bible, what I think about Jesus, what I think about heaven and hell, about prayer. Uh, then about these more soft topics, like about morals in atheism and, and Christianity and religion, the problem of evil, uh, meaning of life, the, the concept of soul, mind and consciousness, uh, and, and, and human emotions. So you can ask me all about these topics, but I will I'll reserve that to them. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was... Now, again, we have the problem to stop this. Thank you. Um, Therefore, uh, I would say we can open the debate or open the floor for questions. That gentleman has a microphone, which I would warmly recommend to use, otherwise it doesn't get 
recorded. So the floor is yours. And of course, questions can be to both or either either one. Of course, both can we, we, we will no. see yep. how it goes. <laughs> Uh, for brothers, what do you think if you have like Steelman, the case uh, for atheists who are like particularly disinterested in like religious concerns, Christianity, whatever? Uh, if you can Steelman the case for Christian side, uh, why should atheists kind of like uh, care about this discussion on like a broader level, if that makes sense? It, it makes sense, but again, I don't have any good answer why anybody should care of anything. It's more what they are motivated about. I, uh, in, in the Free Thinkers, when we made this, you know, tool where people can quit church very easily, like erwakirkosta.fi, more and more people are leaving the, the church, but at the same time they are not joining Free Thinkers, you know, or, or one percent of them are joining. So it seems people in the modern society, they are becoming less and less interested about worldviews in general, whether it's atheism or Christianity. And I'm not sure why, because to me it's very interesting, you know. But some people are interested about things that I'm not interested at all. So I, I, I cannot say why, you know, people are not interested in these very interesting topics, you know. Uh, why, why many atheists, you know, are, you know, non-caring atheists, you know, they, they don't have a strong philosophical foundation for they, their atheism. They just happen to be atheists, you know, because they don't care about worldviews at all. Uh, in, the, in the past, when we didn't have this freedom of religion and, and atheists were being persecuted, of course Christians have been also persecuted, then perhaps there was more cultural motivation for being an active atheist. And I have some friends in the free thinkers who still have very strong feelings that they should, you know, uh, advocate for changing the law so that there would be full, full separation of church and state and, 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 and remove the church of all the rights that they have. I'm not drawing much motivation personally from that, but, but that's what some, some people think. Can I also repeat your question? Your question is why people should be interested or... or, or yeah, other for specific like agnostic people uh, or li like just some like motivation for people who are, aren't like in the religious matters. Like wh why are these discussions important to have? That, that would be... Yeah, let me say, I, I think that if you have strong moral convictions, you would want people to hold beliefs that actually able to support those strong moral convictions. If you're an atheist, that tends to undercut the strength of those moral convictions. So actually, I could quite easily see an atheist saying, I'm not going to try to dissuade people from believing that Jesus was the Son of God and believe those things, because after all, that helps them continue to follow the teachings of Jesus, which, I, which I'm very glad that they do. So as, from an atheist standpoint, one should not dissuade them from believing, even if one can't believe it itself, but one should try to encourage people to believe whatever, they'll, whatever will help them to maintain the moral foundations that they have. And the challenge for the atheist is being able to find some substitute for that. So would like utilitarianism as a term describe the argument here? Well, it's, it's utilitarian, the, the argument, I mean, if I were an atheist, and I would say from utilitarian grounds, I recognize beliefs are very important. Whether you're an atheist, those beliefs are important. Whether you're a Christian, those beliefs are important. So therefore, I want to try to encourage people, just from a social standpoint, to hold the beliefs that will be good for society. So when atheists try to undercut Christianity, they're actually undercutting, undercutting the ethical foundations of the Western world, which is a strange thing to do. This is an important point, and I think we should get back to that. But are there other questions? I'm, I'm collecting here issues, at least, because there might be some interconnections soon. But let's start brainstorming first. Uh, yeah, so I have a question for the atheist side. Um, and, I mean, I would assume that you would think atheism is more rational to believe uh, than Christianity, that it's uh, founded on evidence and, and reasons. That's correct, yes. Yeah, so, um, it seems to me that evolution and naturalism, they can't be held 
together and be rationally believed because evolution, it doesn't select our beliefs for their truth value, but only for their survival value. So uh, there could be, I mean, an infinite amount of false beliefs that are also adaptive rather than true beliefs. So it seems to me that it would be overwhelm overwhelmingly more likely that your beliefs would be false rather than true if naturalism and evolution are true. So I'm wondering, how can you maintain that your view is rational if it's overwhelmingly more likely that you would have a false belief given evolution than a true one? Uh, because the evolution does uh, favor for these surviving ideas, that is one major reason and explanation why religions exist in the first place. So uh, to me, religions represent uh, thinking that might have been originally serving some kind of uh, evolutionary purpose. Uh, it might give uh, people, you know, who are in a desperate situation, for example, it might, the, the, the religious belief might give them the extra strength, you know, to fight harder and, and, and keep going and, and in that, uh, that sense survive uh, in, a, in a very harsh word uh, where without that belief they might give up. Or, for example, for children, the idea that uh, for children the parents can say, oh, don't do that because God forbids you, or don't go there because there's a monster. Like, children can very easily believe crazy things from their parents because if they would be rational and they would be skeptical, you know, they would die. Mm. Yeah? So, so uh, in, indeed, uh, evolution has produced uh, many kind of, I would say, biases and irrational biases to your human thinking. And, and, and because of that, being a very philosophical, rational atheist nowadays, it's a rare thing. It's a rare thing because most people, you know, the big majority, will go along these evolutionary biases for irrational thinking and they will fall to the religions and they will fall to the UFO cults and they will fall to the uh, astrology and, and, and many, many uh, false irrational beliefs, partly because of these evolutionary biases, if, we would, if, if every evolution would have been causing us to have very strong uh, rational biases, uh, ra this kind of uh, atheism would be much more, mu much more common, common than it is. So, so thinking atheists are very rare breed, you know, because of the exactly the re reasons you say. So in, in, in order to be like a good philosophical skeptic uh, and, 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 uh, and, and rational, you need to fight against all these biases in your mind, yeah? You need to do the work, you know, this kind of analytical thinking where you are calculating the probabilities and, 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 and counting the evidence and analyzing the evidence in a very analytical, rational way. That's not the intuitive, quick thinking that evolution has been uh, preparing us for. And evolution has been even giving outsized influence for our emotions, you know, our fears. You know, we know that when a person is made to fear some enemy, then their rationality can go to drain, you know, and, and, and they can be even manipulated to believe things when they have hopes and fears. And again, as a person myself who wants to rationally find the most likely, most probable worldview, I need to sort of, sort of push away, push aside my emotions about what I hope and what I fear, which can be difficult also from the natural point of view. Is this related to this yes, question? Yes. Because I would like also Peter to ah, yeah. reply, maybe ah. just to give more food. But if, if he's immediately no, to reply immediately first, immediately please go ahead. Um, hi, yes, thank you. I don't think your answer answered his question. So when Einstein was doing mathematics in his like hotel room or whatever in 1915, he wrote some equations. And these equations, if you solve them, you predict a thing called a black hole. And now around five, six years ago, we took a picture of that. Now, these kind of abstract thinking, I mean, black holes have literally no um, survival value. And there are many kind of rational capacities that we have that is not immediately, obviously, for adaptation. So he's, um, I think the question was asking, we have this truth capacity. We can explain things that are completely different from our empirical experience, like particle physics and all these kind of things. Um, now, how, does, how do you give an account for the human ability to get to truth with only evolution and naturalism? Because, like Matt mentioned, that evolution seems to choose for adaptation rather than truth. 
So where does this human ability come from? Can, can I ask you to hold your fire and, and we, we listen because then we might have a more okay. complete okay. answer. Yes. And I, I think I see a problem with your questions, but I keep it for myself for now. Okay. Evolution does a good job of uh, causing us to have thinking processes which help us to survive in this world. And there, there are general thinking processes, so it actually helps us be able to solve problems we weren't previously confronted with because they're, they're the same kind of aims. They're the, the, the things where you think are of danger to you, you avoid them. So there are thinking processes which can evolve that way. The difficulty is that when you talk about high-level ideas, what's called metaphysics, those are not connected with survival value. And if anything, if they're connected with survival value, I mean, they seem, they t seem totally irrelevant to it. Believing in God might actually give you greater survival value. Believing in moral right and wrong might give you greater survival value. But when you ask, what, does God exist or atheist or not, he says you follow where the evidence leads. The evidence can lead you to various conclusions. Actually, the evidence, I think, can lead you to believe they're black holes. So if there is concrete evidence that can push you in that direction, but when it comes to asking the question, is there a God out there? Is, is, the, is the physical world all that exists? Those kinds of questions cannot be answered simply by logic. One has to fall back on one's intuitions. But if your intuitions aren't evolved to be able to give you right answers for that, you really can't trust your intuitions. And they're equally brilliant Christian philosophers and atheist philosophers who, when they're talking about their broad ideas, they act to the same data, the same argument. They can recognize each other's arguments, but one feels that the idea of God makes no sense whatsoever, and the other one says, yes, it makes perfectly good sense. After all, look at, look at the, the thinking animals and creatures and ourselves and all the thought processes we have. Surely there's something like mind behind the universe. But how you weigh that is not something which is dictated by logic. Excellent. I think I start to see uh, an epistemological, a problem relating to uh, the nature of knowledge and the production or creation of knowledge, and especially with the notion of truth. Because it's possible that uh, when the gentleman in the audience talks about truth, he has something else in mind than when we talk about truth. But now, please. Well, not Your necessarily in the primitive sense. When we are in the, in the caveman era, you know, when the human evolution is happening, then of course, also, truth about your local environment and simple things does have absolute evolutionary value. You know, whether there's going to be a good year of harvest or, or whether you have some game animal there or game animal there, that will also depend your survivability, whether you will truthfully know, know that. Whether there's some enemy attacking or whether you can attack the en enemy, whether somebody's sick or not sick, you need, there's a lot of... Uh, evolution uh, value in, in you knowing the true thing of your environment and, and, and state. Uh, of course, that, that, that relates to, you know, quite simple, you know, things in your environment, but still that produces uh, also evolutionary adaptation for understanding evidence and, and, and looking at, 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 at things and, and making deductions. Of course, even the caveman needs to do this, and that's why our brains were getting bigger. Humans are the intelligent animals because we were in an evolutionary environment where the evolutionary pressure was actually pushing us to become more and more intelligent. So we are intelligent pieces, but still, today, it takes an exceptional individual to, to, like Einstein, you know, to, to invent this theory of relativity that's extremely difficult, you know? So, so uh, you know, evolution was preparing us for this level, you know? But we have, because for every feature of humans, we have this distribution of features. Some are more here, some are... So, so evolution prepared us for uh, medical intelligence, but we have some exceptional individuals who can then understand the, the nature of the, you know, natural laws, you know, in, in, in a way that's very rare. Can I um, yeah. skip for a moment? Yeah, so the gentleman was also asking, we, we will get back to this, I mean. Yeah, so at I'm, the same I'm, time, when, the, uh, when, when evolution can push us to develop rationality, it can also develop us to, to invent religious explanations, you know, for things that we don't understand. They can both, both coexist. Uh, when, when, when we ask a question and, we, and they answer, it doesn't mean that the answer finished the topic. So now we are just put, throwing ideas and issues and we can go back and forth. Please. Okay, thank you. Uh, this uh, question goes to Robert. And uh, so as a warm-up, 
Uh, could you just answer yes or no for the following question? Uh, if Christian... Not before I hear the question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh, you, you can add more, but just maybe... I, just... I, I will promise I will do my best. Okay, thank you. I, I'm usually quite straightforward, but okay. I don't like trick questions either. <laughs> okay, this is, this is not a trick question. Okay. So if Christianity was true, would you become a Christian? Yes. Okay, so you're open to um, the evidence? Yes, I am that. absolutely open to the evidence. Okay. Uh, a bit related to that, you said that you find that the probability of God existing is uh, quite low. Yes. And so how would you determine a probability for something like that? Yeah, that's a very good question, and it's a very complex topic. And uh, I will only scratch the surface very little, okay? But if you want, you can Google about uh, a, a thing called Bayesian, Bayesian probability. So there are different definitions for probability. Uh, the, uh, for example, in quantum mechanics, there's probability of even, events happening. But Bayesian probability is, is, is a way of analyzing evidence. Uh, and it is, it is used to some degree, for example, in, in some courts of law. And it can be used in medical professional, for example, also either for, for, for analyzing the evidence about some disease and trying to determine diagnosis. So, so, uh, so Bayesian probability is the kind of probability I'm, I'm referring to here. And Bayesian probability allows uh, in principle, uh, the, the, the assessment uh, and analysis of, of, uh, of evidence and how the evidence is, is affecting uh, probability. Of course, that to, to derive to some numerical values, you need to make assumptions yeah, uh, about, about this. But, but typically, when you do the kind of Bayesian analysis for, for you know, supernatural or religious or, or, or God-like things, typically, uh, the, the result is that the probability is so small that it doesn't much depend on your precise, precise assumptions. There's another variation, which you can also Google, uh, which is called the, the minimum description length calculation, which is uh, a variation. Uh, it, it can be shown to be equivalent to the Bayesian probabilities, but it is basically uh, comparing hypothesis probability based on uh, their complexity, and, 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 and based, based on the, uh, how, how well they match evidence. And, and if you have ever heard of the Occam's razor, which is like a skeptical tool, uh, this, this uh, MDR calculation is a bit like a mathematical representation of, of Occam's razor for analyzing different theories. Yeah, probability, it doesn't answer it at all. <coughs> there's no probabilities that tells you atheism is true or God is true. When you talk about probabilities, there's relative past frequency, that's one way of looking at it. Another way is to uh, look at what's the, the Bayesian view. The Bayesian view, however, doesn't give you it. The third, third is sort of philosophical probability. The philosophical probability of what sort of, by your intuitions, make most sense to you, not based on some sort of quantitative analysis. The Bayesian approach says you can assign whatever probabilities you want, but whatever the probabilities are, then you stick with those, and as the evidence comes in, it can force your beliefs towards the particular conclusion. I did my dissertation on the argument from design and decided the Bayesian approach is not going to work in that context. Because after all, if you asked a person, what's the likelihood of the universe being extraordinarily fine-tuned for the possibility of life? A person says, well, I don't know what that is. I'll just I'll take a Bayesian approach and I'll say one out of a million. All right? Then you start doing these calculations and begin to realize the probability of life, actually the constants being right, end up being much, much smaller than that. Now, if you're following the Bayesian principles, you should be driven towards belief in God. But I think the, I think the atheist will be quite right in saying, no, I'm not going to go the Bayesian route, because after all, my conviction that God exists was much stronger than the probability I've gave one out of a million. So therefore, I'm going to back off from my initial statement and simply say, God doesn't exist. So probably even the Bayesian way does not answer those fundamental questions. I would like to comment on the question, because I think, the, if, if, if you don't mind, uh, did I understand correctly, you ask, if uh, Christianity was true, would you believe it? So this is tautological, because you are assuming that if it's true, of course, we're going to believe it by definition, but I think there is an element in your question which somehow got lost in the answer, if I, if I am allowed. You are connecting belief and identity. In science, we know, when we publish and somebody trash our paper, we feel bad. 
is an emotional thing. We don't care about what is true. We, we care about the pain. But in, in the academic game, you have to be humble. You know, you have to rely on others, on the peers, to, to improve. It's called um, positive uh, narcissism. You know, it's what you push you to run faster if you're a sport person. So, uh, my question would be to turn it around. Do you think Christians would accept that there isn't such a thing as the Christian God? You know, but I think the most important thing for the purpose of this thing is, can we learn to distinguish our identity from our belief? Can we be independent? You know, can we put our self-esteem? Because otherwise we cannot learn. Otherwise learning, the difference, this is exactly the topic I was going to discuss, becomes too painful. If we think that everybody who agree, disagrees with us is a threat. I think he just wanted to comment and then definitely. You want to comment immediately? Yes. Please. Um, I think our beliefs form our identity and our habits and what we choose. So I think it is completely important how reality is like and how we are like because that forms how we become happy or sad, how we become ill or healthy. Um, so I, I think expecting us to separate our beliefs from our identity is not rational because it, my beliefs about what it means to be in a friendship affects how I will be in a friendship. Um, my beliefs about health will affect how I act according to health. Um, but I do think we should be humble in the sense that we shouldn't uh, irrationally reject something because it feels wrong. Painful. Yeah, I mean, I know what you mean with the science, but I think science aims towards truth. Um, and I, by truth, I mean a real description of things. Um, yes, that's my comment. Thank you, but now we want to, the answer maybe to your question, then definitely. Uh, yes, it's a follow-up question on the probability, because uh, a little bit... Uh, concerning your talk also about the teleological argument or the design argument. So uh, I would grant that if, like given a universe, then we have a probability of, uh, of, um, of, of hypotheses about whether it was designed or just a coincidence. But I think we can, can go uh, kind of anterior to that and just the existence of the universe as such. I don't think there's a probability uh, it's an either-or topic or issue that the universe needs a cause that is uh, outside of itself. And that because the other option it would, would be to say that it just either caused, its, caused itself or uh, just has no explanation or, or it is eternal, which is not the case. Nowadays, everybody seems to be uh, admitting that. So my uh, question would be, so... I think atheism doesn't get off the ground un unless you grant that nothing produces something. And uh, I think that's just uh, not rational at all. So I think that's why atheism should be rejected. So what would, what would be your uh, answer to This is a question for Robert. Yeah, yeah, probably. Perhaps I will still a bit comment on, yes, yes, on, on the earlier cases. Uh, b because the uh, description regarding the probabilities was, was very theoretic. I will give you some... Quick, quick examples. Uh, we all know the, the the Matrix movie, you know, where this guy suddenly realizes that oh, everything I have seen here is an illusion, you know, and he's waking up in this true world. Yeah, and and the question is, why is it unlikely that we live in a in a Matrix world? Okay, and. It, it can be answered in terms of the, 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 the Bayesian probability, and it can also be answered in terms of the, another important topic, which is the falsifia, falsifiability of, of a theory. So if you make, if I make a theory that, okay, there's no God, but everything in the universe is explained by atomic-sized elves, you know, that are moving everything there intelligently, that is absolutely compatible with all the evidence we have in the world. It can be so. But it's very unlikely, and one of the reasons is that it's, it cannot, it, it's a non-falsifiable theory. And again, if you Google in the internet and you research on this, you can find out why theories that cannot be falsified are easily extremely unlikely. Okay, so that was the example there. Uh, we can move to the, 
other big topic about cause of the universe. Big, cause of the universe. Yeah, we yeah, do the, that, or do you still want to comment on this? Yeah, yeah. Just say, saying that that it's extremely unlikely that I am just wired up to be believing uh, like the Matrix. Mm. Uh, that's not a probability. There's not a probability you can assign to it. One can say, so is there, is there reason for my believing it? And there's some substance to it. If there's no reason for my believing it, then that becomes reason for my not believing it. But it doesn't have to do with probabilities. It's a lack of reason. We need reasons for things we're going to believe because, after all, you could come up with just about anything. But if you don't have any reason for it, then there's just believing it. It's not a matter of probabilities. It's a matter of being just, just that's, it's, it's not tenable because there's not, good, not reasons for it. The probability doesn't enter into it. Yeah, I, I think probably does enter that the reason makes it, the reasons make something probable or not. But shall we move to the uh, let, beginning? Let's keep probability, beginning. yes or yeah. no, as a methodological opportunities, because there's the cause of the universe question which you need to be answered now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I have been thinking that the problem of uh, origin of everything, it's a very difficult problem. And it's a problem that is not solved by saying God created everything, because then we have the age-old question, where did God come from? Yeah? So uh, if, we, if we make another definition, let me make another definition. I call this definition the super-universe, okay? And super-universe includes absolutely everything. There is nothing that exists that is not in the super-universe. So the question is, where did the super-universe come from, or has it always existed? Remember, super-universe includes everything. If there are gods or fairies or tiny elves, super-universe includes them. So it's a, it's a difficult problem, but I find a bit like consciousness. Consciousness is a difficult problem, and just throwing in the supernatural explanation that is actually not providing a good explanation. But if we want to, so, so, so the, 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 whatever explanation there is, is going to be very difficult. Yeah? And there are sci uh, honest scientific, uh, like cosmological uh, models and, 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 uh, and, let's say, theories that are proceeding and approaching this question in the way that there's less and less and less things to be explained. So we see this trend. We see this trend in science. When science is explaining something, there's less and less and less things to explain. And perhaps this trend continues all the way. Perhaps. We don't know yet. You wanted to say something about this. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll pass over. You say something like, or whoever. Uh, I, I let Job answer the cosmological side of the, but I would like to comment. Uh, maybe maybe I insert something here. Actually, when it comes to, was the Big Bang the absolute beginning? The fact of the matter is we don't have an answer to that. Uh, when it comes to the, the very first quantum, we don't have a synthesis of quantum mechanics and general relativity. String theory is trying to unify them together, but we don't have any mathematical model for it. So there's, there's, science doesn't answer the question, did the universe have an absolute beginning? And there are a fair number of cosmologists out there that says this wasn't the beginning. There is the problem, however, if the universe has always existed, how is it that the second law of thermodynamics fits in with that? Because even if you have cyclical universes or one universe following from another, it seems as though there ought to be less and less usable energy and you can't go back infinitely for that. So the problem of the origin of the universe is a, is a very difficult one to answer from a, a scientific standpoint. Sometimes people say it was, it was a quantum fluctuation out of nothing. Well, if it's a quantum fluctuation of nothing, the nothing is something. Mm -hmm. Because after all, physics has to apply to it. But also, when you say there's a quantum fluctuation out of nothing, our, our understanding of quantum mechanics is intrinsically probabilistic. Depends on what's the likelihood of an event taking place in some volume of space over a given period of time. When you take away coherent space and time before the Big Bang, and you think there is a quantum fluctuation, probability has no meaning whatsoever. So you're actually using the term quantum, quantum fluctuation is, a, is just a, a metaphor. It doesn't have any basis to it. So there's a fun, fundamental mystery. So what brought about, at least there's explanatory power in saying that God brought about rather than simply saying that it is. And before I pass the mic to Job, um, because I want to hear his answer, the, I just a quick comment on your conception of God, that God is uh, 
the conception of God traditionally has been in an eternal, uncreated being, uncaused being. So we can't ask what caused God, because that's just a, a non-question. God is eternal and uncaused. But now we'll pass the mic. Um, two comments. Uh, just firstly on this, who created God as well. Um, just by definition, either the universe always existed, so it is self-existing, or it got its existence from something. Either it caused itself or something else caused it. Now, um, if you say God made the universe, the hypothesis is actually, it is interesting. It's not, uh, um, it, you're saying basically that the universe is not the kind of thing that can be self-caused. So that's a positive hypothesis that you can test. Now, um, you mentioned that science is going to less and less uh, explanations. Um, I appreciate that because I think that is a, a real avenue of inquiry to answer this question. Um, but I do not think it is the case that particle physics and cosmology is going towards less and less explanations. So for example, string theory, which was a candidate for solving particle physics problems, is very non-explanatory. It has some ridiculous number of possible parameter values. So it's not solving the problem at all. And there, there you're not really, it's not a very common discussion point at physics faculties that I'm aware of nowadays um, and we have this problem of the standard model of particle physics that there are many numbers that have no theoretical explanation we just plug them into the equations and that seems to point to me that the universe is not the kind of thing which is its own explanation both in the constants in the laws of nature and also the mathematical form of the laws of nature that also has no explanation it could have been other kinds of mathematics that we use to describe the universe than the one we have. Um, Thank you. We have a question there. I hope we don't limit the discussion of God on physics and quantum physics because otherwise it's going to get quite boring, but it's good that you mention it. A quick, a very telegraphic comment. Yeah, so I, th I sometimes use this metaphor of cavemen and lightning. So if, ca if two cavemen see a lightning, they don't know what it is. And the one caveman can say, that's God. That's God's, you know, fire arrow. And ask, how can you explain it? And the other caveman, let's say he's a skeptic caveman, he says, I don't know, but your, ex your explanation is still bad. Yeah? So that's how the God explanation is. It's still it's still an unlikely explanation, even if we don't know the true explanation. Okay? Yeah. Mm. I'm considering. Yeah, I think I'll ask this one. Uh, I, I'm curious. Uh, do, do you agree with this like, conception broadly about the fact that like, uh, the God is eternal? So there's like, uh, it, it's like an axiomatic thing that, that you, you don't actually have to like, prove it, uh, that it has to have a cause. It's, God is just kind of there. Yeah, if you think God is eternal, it means he's always existed in time. No, I think physical time is actually something created by God. Yeah. I think an illustration that this good Bertrand Russell once uh, used the what caused God kind of argument by using a, a student came to an Indian guru and, and says, what does the world rest on? And he says, the rest on the back of a giant elephant. And what does the elephant rest on? He says, the elephant stands on the back of a giant tortoise. And the student asks, well, what does the giant tortoise rest on? And the, the guru says, go away, don't bother me. Okay, but the guru could have said, the world, the elephant, and the giant tortoise rest in infinite space. If the student <coughs> said, well, what does infinite space rest on? The, the guru, because you don't understand the concept of infinite space. You're going from finite things to something which is not finite. If you're going to take seriously the notion of God, God is not some super powerful finite thing. He is infinite. He's not a finite thing. So you can still ask, what caused God? But it's not all clear that the chain of reasoning that you have should cause you to believe there's going to be something there. And it's just like asking, why, why, does the, why does the world, the elephant, the tortoise rest in infinite space? It's not clear that there should be an answer to that. Infinite space could be the stopping point. Okay, so if, if we're going to formalize this, we could say that, like, uh, I, I'm, I'm, like, trying to conceptualize this idea. Uh, we'd have God as a concept here, and we could, like, assign the property of, like, eternal in it. So infinite, um, this sort of stuff. Mm, what, what takes us to the point that we cannot assign that property to the universe to like begin with? Like if I understand this, like why, why, why can't we just say that the universe is foundational instead of stating that God is like foundational and the universe doesn't have to have a beginning? 
but the God, like why, why can't the universe be just like a self-contained thing? Yeah, I, I don't think probability is going to answer that question, but there is the question of explanatory power. So for instance, I'll give a quote here from Stephen Hawking. He, he said this, basically the same thing in, uh, uh, in his first book, but in the grand design he writes, the laws of nature form a system that is extremely fine-tuned and very little of physical law can be altered without destroying the possibility of the development of life as we know it. Were it not for a series of startling coincidences in the precise details of physical law, it seems humans and similar life forms would never have come into being. His response is to say, well, we live in a universe where all possible worlds are actualized, both in the many worlds interpretation, plus his M theory has this vast, vast number of universes. So this vast number of universes, you're going to have some place where life is possible, we have to be there. If you ask, what's the probability that that understanding is right? I don't think you could apply probabilities to it. There is some explanatory power to it, but there's also explanatory power saying, well, if you had a universe that has no mind to it whatsoever and just had some physical laws, does it seem to us in terms of uh, what kind of, what would, expect, would one expect that a universe would somehow at some point along the line have intelligent beings that evolve and are able to reflect on their own existence? Now, there's explanatory and power saying, well, yes, actually, we can, it's not so surprising if we believe that there's actually a mind behind the universe that created it this way. So there's explanatory power that lies behind it, but it's not where you could quanti quantitatively say one is more probabilistic than the other. I think the category of probability simply doesn't apply in that in situation. Maybe this side. Yeah, I just want to clarify uh, regarding this uh, being less and less things to explain. Yeah, uh, if we go 4,000 years back in time and we think of the you know the uh, cultures at that time, they had no clue, you know of much of the how, how the universe worked, you know, what was the logic of cells, you know, in their body and what were the, you know, stars they, they saw in the sky. They had so many things they didn't understand that believing in some religion at that time, especially with the psychological, you know, biases, made much more sense, yeah? And, and even, even if we go 300 years back, you know, we, we knew there are, 100,000 different kind of chemicals. How can you explain all of them? But then they could be explained with only 100 different kind of atoms. And there were so many forces, and they could be explained only with four basic forces. This is called reductionism. And reductionism, if you look at this uh, Bayesian probabilities or, or, or these theories, you can see that reductionism is exactly the thing that makes scientific theories wonderfully probable compared to non-falsifiable magical explanations. And when we go further and further, we see all the atoms can be explained even with smaller number of particles and all the forces are, are unified. So for a, a person thinking 4,000 years ago, oh, all this wonderful thing, how can they come into existence? I would say to a great extent we have been explaining how they have been coming into existence without the very early fraction of second of the Big Bang 14.8 billion years ago. So there's a huge amount of explanations and, and the origin state that we are talking about is extremely simple compared to the complex set of today. Please, the yeah. graphics so the, 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 assumption, the assumption Robert's making is that somehow the Christian faith is opposed or it conflicts with the idea that we live in an exquisitely ordered universe where at no point does God need to do miracles to sustain it. It actually fits quite well with Christian theology, the, the description of the world not as being controlled by spirits, but a world which God has made and is part of the reason why science arose in the West. And so it makes perfectly good sense from a Christian standpoint to say God has created a world where, he's, where the order he has created does not require God doing miracles anywhere. So as we're looking at the world, we understand more and more and more. And on this vast amount that we don't understand, we're sort of, when we have to look at the, the sort of micro level, there's huge amounts we don't understand. But from a Christian standpoint, I think that we would be able to explain all of that. But the Christian faith does not rest on our ignorance about how things work in the natural world. Both Christianity and, and Judaism rest on the belief that God has acted in history at particular points in time and has revealed himself in that way. And he's spoken through prophets in revealing himself in that way. 
But so science doesn't answer that at all. And saying that science is able to explain everything in the physical world around us is not squeezing God out of the picture. It's saying that God has created an ex exquisitely ordered universe and it doesn't answer the question whether God does act in this world in ways which are independent of that order or ways which are, I would call, order of nature miracles as opposed, I mean, specific point miracles as opposed to order of nature miracles. More questions. Can we have the gentleman here? Yeah, um, so, like, I think so far the discussion has been, I would say, like, quite metaphysical. Like, uh, we discussed, like, um, the existence of God, but it seems that, like, we can't even agree on the frame that we feel the road, like, based in probability, like, like, there is even a disagreement on the frame itself. So, um, I hope that, like, uh, you guys wouldn't mind that I drag down the discussion a bit. And I have like two questions respectively. Uh, the first question is for Pizza is like, um, so as I hear from your opening thesis, you mentioned that like, um, um, like the Christian faith can be proved by reasoning. So we were mind to like walk us briefly and why don't you go for another path? Because I believe there are some uh, Christian that they, they, they do admit that like um, their, their faith is like, is not maybe very well supported by reasoning. So like why, why you choose this approach. And my second question is for Robert. And can we get a consensus that in Western developed countries, like it seems that the uh, influence of religious particular Christianity is, is fading a bit or is, is losing a bit. Can we get a consensus on this? Can we, get what? First part? can we get a consensus that like in Western developed countries, um, like the influence of religious particularly Christian, uh, Christian is like a losing a bit of influence compared to like, of course, like compared to Middle Age or, or earlier. Or yes, it's losing influence, but is there a question there? Is, can, we, can we agree on this first? We can agree. Yes. Okay. So uh, what is the reason, like in your, in, in, in your opinion, what is the reason and what is the impact? Okay. Is it just can because I, of the scientific discoveries? Yeah. Can I re respond on the first part? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's okay, okay. So the first, first part was, I do not think you can prove the Christian faith is true. Okay. But I think it's very, very important that it's a reasonable belief. A reasonable belief is one where you're able to appeal to, uh, appeal to reasons, where there's explanatory power in those reasons. People will differ on how much weight to give to those reasons. There are reasons that atheists would give, that they're going to put much more weight on those reasons than, say, Christians would. But I think it's very, very important that there be reasons for the faith that be reasonable. So, for instance, for me, it's very important that when you look at the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, it actually is much stronger than you would assume would be the case. It doesn't prove it, because after all, a person say, well, dead people don't rise. Right? So that, there's that philosophical question. But nonetheless, I think it's vitally important that the Christian faith be a reasonable faith. Decline of Christianity in the West. Yeah. Uh, I must comment earlier. You said natural science does not squeeze religion out. Well, you can say that, and of course there are many people nowadays who agree with that, but still there are many people today, for example, who Christians who cling to the 6,000 year old young earth creationism because they think giving up that would destroy the religion. So that, That's not my position. I know, I know, but I'm just that's saying that historically, <laughs> you know, Christians had been fighting Tate, you know, hard to, to oppose some of these scientific, you know, progresses, and it's, it's, it's been a difficult journey for them, you know, to, to, to accept this. Just saying. Okay. Uh, reasons for Christian declining, uh, I would say two things. Uh, one is what we already discussed, just the fact that, that uh, scientific worldview and, and, and the scientific explanation of many of the normal things we see here around us, you know, not perhaps the smallest particles or, b or Big Bang, but, but normal everyday things are so much explained by, by, by science that, that there's no, not so much need for uh, uh, religious explanation. But perhaps even more importantly in practice, on emotional level, we have seen that uh, people find religion most important when they are struggling, when the life is really hard, you know, when they, uh, when they are facing war or such thing. And, and in the past, generally, life was more hard. You know, there was lack of food, there was more disease, there was not good medication, you know. People were mostly poor and struggling and dying and suffering. And in those kind of conditions, the, 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 the 
need for the religion, you know, to, to keep you going might have been stronger. So, so today's teenagers, you know, who don't care, they don't care even of atheism, they don't care of religion, you know, their life is good enough, you know, they think, where do I need religion? I don't need religion, you know, so, so that might be even more important nowadays. Thank you. Maybe this gentleman first, because you've been already asking a lot of questions, which is good, but we want to give a chance to everybody. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to continue from what you said yourself, that there's a lot of people leaving the churches, leaving religion, but they're not signing up to be in your organizations, mm. atheist organizations. Isn't there, there a probability that, that your uh, intellectual atheism in the long run will be extinct? I, I hope it to be extinct in, in the sense that, of course, if there would be no religions, then of course there would not no be atheism either. Like, uh, <laughs> I, I have been all, <laughs> often saying that my lack of belief in God is same as my lack of belief in Santa Claus or, or, or you know, uh, unicorns. Yeah, there, there's no difference. So, but but there's no associations for people not believing unicorns because unicorns. Unicorn believers are not a main force in the society, you know, that, that you know, need some kind of uh, balancing force. So, so in the sense, uh, just like for many, you know, political movements, the, the, the main target of the political movement might be to make yourself unnecessary. I would like to, to, to you can, I just want to have a semantic uh, clarification. We should not confuse spirituality with religion. We all have spiritual needs, we've been discussing that before, like we need to eat. But we have different religions, like we eat different kind of food. Uh, I think to flatten the problem of do we need religion to the problem do we need spirituality is, uh, is a false epistemic. It's, it's, a, it's the wrong way to ask the questions. Uh, and, and if I can intervene on your question, there might be less, more people leaving the congregations in Finland and, and in Italy, people are becoming less Catholic. Uh, if I go maybe a little bit beyond my role and answer this question, it's because young people are not satisfied with the official recipe for spirituality. It's about hypocrisy. It's about the misuse of religion by people who don't deserve to have that position. So it's about power. We don't have unicorn religion because we don't have a group of people willing to fight, set up, you know, thing. Uh, but there are a lot of religious belief in which people experience what we could call the experience of God, whatever that means, not the Christian God, but some sort of transcendental in a private way. And what we are witnessing, I think there are research in this sense, people more and more experience religiosity, no, not, not religion, they get away from the church, but they experience the supernatural or the metaphysics in the private sphere. But of course, this is problematic, especially for young people. You know, you need meaning and you don't find anybody who offer you credible meaning. And of course, for professional educators, uh, you know, the problem is not which God, but the materiality of the life. You know, it seems that we should not believe in anything else than, than money and, and material success. That is the danger, I think. That's why people of faith should learn to talk to each other. Sorry for this ranting, you had a question. Uh, did, did you have a question? Oh, who, who had a question? Sorry, you. I, I, I've lost it a little bit. <laughs> uh, so when you were talking about how science it has more and more explanations and there's less, uh, that almost seems to sound a little bit to me like you're presupposing some version of scientism. I don't know if that's right, that maybe science is the best way to knowledge or, or the, something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure how you would, uh, perhaps there are different descriptions of sci scientism, but definitely the, the scientific method is, mm. is utilizing evidence, and, and the scientific method is uh, trying to uh, counter for this kind of uh, biases in our thinking. So we, were thi we, we, we already noted that, that, that evolution has been producing our rational minds as rather flawed. You know, not, not perfect at all. And, and, and science tries to counter for that by, by uh, providing a more rigorous method. For example, requiring replication of some experiments uh, and, and requiring peer, peer review um, uh, so, so that, that you know, the, the biases and the errors of the individual scientist would be more flattened out. There, there are many other biases of, of humans and there are many other 
for example, the use of statistical methods in science, you know, which, which can often come down to the, the, the Bayesian probabilities. Surprise, surprise. So uh, there are, I, I would say science uh, is, is a good method. It's, it's, not, it's not perfect method, uh, but it has been also increasingly developed. You know, science started as a very, uh, science even started from superstition, you know, from like alchemy, you know, those were the first mm -hmm. chemists, you know, trying to make gold. But, 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 but science has been showing during the centuries to be able to improve and able to incorporate new and new checks, you know, that, uh, that are fighting against, you know, the, 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 the easy, easy falling to superstition and the easy falling to, to erroneous, you know, uh, beliefs. So, so it is reasonably good, at least compared to many other ways of knowing, yes. I think the reason why religious belief has declined so much in Europe over the last several decades is that people have come to believe that, that the science tells us that we live in a purely physical world. Mm -hmm. Now, whether or not there's good reasons for that, nonetheless, I think that has been, been driven by it. Plus, if a person thinks, well, I'm sufficient in myself. Jesus says it's harder for a rich person to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through the eye. When we have everything going for us, our temptation is to rely upon ourselves. And if you combine that with thinking, well, science tells us we have nothing but the physical world, that, I think, explains why it is that, 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 that Europe has so, so declined in it. It's not that they've bought into a materialism. After all, people t typically believe that they do exist and that their thoughts are actually guiding their lives. It's not that their thoughts are just carried along by their brains. Whereas if you're a materialist, which most atheists are, you're strongly driven towards the view that, in fact, your conscious thoughts have no effect whatsoever on the course of your brain. Rather, your course of your brain is carrying your thoughts with you. I think most people would not agree with that. And philosophically speaking, I think people should not agree with that. So that means that the scientism or the materialism way of looking at the world is mistaken. And people recognize also that ethics is lost if you go to a materialist view, and they're not going to let go of ethics. So a lot of people move from believing, say they're Christians, to believing in something. And I would say that believing in something is specifically not going in the direction of naturalism because there has to be something beyond the natural that's going to give life meaning, and hence they continue to hold on to it. So even in Chechia, which is the most, one of the most secular countries in Europe, in 2005, 50% of the people believed that there was something even though church attendance was very, very small. So I think those are the things which are driving the drop in, in church attendance. And, the, and in fact, it's a mistake on the part of people to think that the success of science is squeezing God out of the picture. And time and time again, you say, look how science is able to use Bayesian theory to, to explore scientific theory. Yes, it can. But Bayesian theory does not apply to the metaphysical questions and issues. I don't know where's the microphone. I change the topic. <laughs> but we need the microphone. Yeah. Oh, there. Yeah, sure. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you wouldn't say that science is the best way to knowledge, but it's one avenue of of how we can attain knowledge, or I, I would say from the various ways of obtaining knowledge I have heard of, it's the best. Okay. Because um, my my problem with that is, it seems to me that science it has all these philosophical assumptions like that your cognitive faculties are reliable or even the idea that science is the best way to knowledge that's a philosophical claim it's not one that could be tested by science so it seems like you need to allow some kind of philosophy into your epistemology so why wouldn't the philosophy take precedent over the science if you need it to have those presuppositions and validate those presuppositions to do science that's what they do, actually. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't see philosophy and science as as incompatible. You know, they are supporting each other. Yeah, I, I, I didn't. I mean, there is this philosophy of science. Yeah, and when I was describing you the scientific method, you know, many philosophers would describe that under philosophy of science. You know, so I, I'm not sure where the philosophy ends and science starts. I, I I'm considering. Perhaps the, the practice of doing science, you know, I would call science, and then, but, but this, this uh, methodology of science, it can be described as, as philosophy of science. Of course, if that philosophy is sound and it's reasonable in the way it's, uh, you know, producing results, then science is still a, a good way of know, knowing. Uh, so, yeah, uh, you, you said that uh, you should have to assume in science like the 
perfect uh, working of the, of the human mind, but, but science is exactly like I described, a method to try to uh, compensate for the flawed nature of the human mind, you know, like, like we are human mind, you know, as a, as a rational thinker from, from the evolution, we are like a, like a crippled man, you know, trying to walk. And, and perhaps science provides some, you know, walking sticks, you know, and, and some, some support, you know, that we can, we can walk in a, in a bit more straightforward line. But everybody knows science sometimes goes astray, you know, and, 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 and we might hear five years later, oh, this result was wrong and this result was overturned. So, so there are many mistakes happening even within science. It's only in the, in the longer term that we see the, the huge progress of science and the mistakes corrected, you know. You, you never see religion correcting their mistakes, you know, in this kind of way. Religions just split up into debating sub-religions and sub-religions which will never merge because they don't have the scientific method to establish whether Catholicism is the right or the Protestantism is the right. Whoever come first. Uh, now I was going to say the, the distinctive way science work, which is unique, and according to some is connected to the idea of democracy, is science as the tools to correct itself. So the idea that we might be, we think we are right now and we might be proved wrong tomorrow is embedded in the notion of science. Of course, when we talk about scientism, like every ism, is the idea that everything can be fixed with science. But there's a lot of scientists who claim science is a very powerful tool, but for a very limited kind of questions. So we cannot study non-phenomena, you know, which are the most important in individual life. But uh, I don't know which one. Yeah, please. Thanks. So maybe just for a comment, I don't think any Christian would, would deny that, that science is the best way of, of, of examining physical nature. But there are other things beside physical nature, like other disciplines, like ethics and metaphysics and stuff like that. So, uh, like, there's absolutely no contradiction in, in believing that science gives us knowledge from the physical world and believing in, in Christian theism. But then my question would be that you have been appealing a lot to natural evolution, but my question would be, without presupposing naturalism, how do you know that we evolved from apes? Because there are a lot of qualitative, that I call qualitative jumps, like for example, rationality, morality, but because when I look at you, I don't see an ape. I, 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 I am an ape, of I'm course. Not, I'm not seeing an ape when <laughs> I look at you. Uh, as a Christian, I believe that you're made in the image of I am, I am even multicellular animal, even that description, and I'm also mammal. But how, how, would, you, how would you know that that's the case, given the all sorts of difficulties in uh, evolutionary proof? I, I think the question is that you, you, you're suggesting there are some gaps, there are some jumps, yes. which cannot be explained by evolutionary theory, and then the answer is, how come? Maybe. If you are ready yeah, to yeah, let me say, I think if you, you think of evolution as being the statement that life changed over time in a, in a gradual process over a long period of time, I think there's a lot of evidence to support that. But if what it means by evolution is that everything happens simply by blind chance with no, no God not being involved in all, everything, everything happening in that way, uh, science doesn't tell us that. I mean, we don't know whether God worked to, to have this biochemical structure arise at a particular time and then things took off from there. So the, it's the assumption that everything happened without any outside input is unscientific and that can't be demonstrated, it can't be proved, there's no way being established by a scientific method, it's simply a question that can't be addressed. So to think that science tells us that everything will happen without any, outside, without any guidance from outside is simply an unscientific proclamation. Other version. Yeah, so uh, compared to your original point was that uh, without assuming naturalism, how I can proceed. Now, uh, I have heard many versions of this, uh, and my answer is that in, in science, we make hypotheses. Yeah? And when you make a hypothesis, it's like a, like a mind, mind play, you know? You just invent something. There doesn't, it's not an assumption, it's not, a, it's not a presupposition, it's a hypothesis. And then we can evaluate what we see we can evaluate evidence and we can see how well uh, they match with the hypotheses and how well they support the hypotheses and we can even use statistics in that and if uh, and, and in that way we can arrive to the conclusion 
that the hypothesis is correct, or, or the hypothesis is likely to be correct, without presupposing anything. Yeah? So saying that we need to presuppose some things, you know, in order to even start doing science, it doesn't have to be that way. They can all be conclusions, and we only start with hypotheses. Okay? Let me just say that you know, I'm perfectly content with a person saying that atheism is a hypothesis and theism is a hypothesis. But my contention is that probabilities are not going to establish who's right and who's wrong. There are reasons that can support one or the other, and I think it's important that one looks at those reasons, and a rational atheism or a rational theism is going to be appealing to those reasons. But to think the statistics and probability science is going to tell you which, the, which is the right answer, that is not the case. The gentleman. Hi, hi, Robert. So, short question. So, how will uh, atheists respond to the meaning question? Like, atheists don't care, or what's the approach? Okay. Which meaning? I'm sorry. Uh, like, meaning of life, or something like that? Uh, yeah, as previously discussed, it's like, uh, okay. like you, you said, like, the young generation, like, um, they don't face war or that kind of, like, maybe physical struggle. But, well, if you look at data, sure. it's like, people are depressed or okay. those kind of things, uh, like how I, we I will answer, although now we are jumping between meaning and creationism and back to meaning, and so it's a yeah. bit, bit bouncy. I will quickly say about creationism and, and, and evolution. Uh, I, of course, many, many liberal Christians accept evolution, and, 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 and that's fine and good, but I, I do think it's important to note how many honest, strong Christians there are who will cling to the creationism, and, and especially young earth creationism, and say that this is very, very, very important part of our faith. And, and this is according to what Bible says, and our faith will go down the drain if this is given up. And that's something that should give all Christians a pause, you know. Why is it so important for them to, to, to stick into that? And, and I think it's a good, it makes a good point, because if you take the evolutionary view of how humans arrived here, then humans did not arrive here like the Bible says. Humans did not come here by God creating, but evolving from an ape, like you said. Yeah? So I do understand why those creationists will you know, fight against the evidence to see it, and I find it a bit mind-boggling that the liberal Christians can combine, you know, evolution and still somehow think, you know, God still did it, you know, with some sprinkling of magic dust, you know, to the evolutionary process. I, I don't find that convincing at all. And let me say, say that the people who interpret Genesis 1 as being literal, as much of a scientific description, there's two camps of people who believe that. One, there are the young earth creationists, and the other side, they're the adamant atheists. But the people who actually understand literature, understand ancient literature, say, no, that's not the case. It's much, much more complicated what's going on there. And it's interesting to me that the atheists buy into it because they want to whack away at the young earth creationists, not because they actually have some reason for believing that's the right way of understanding Genesis 1. It's a myth type of thing. The well, it, it, there's, the, there's, the, there's, myth. the word myth is loaded. But uh, yeah, it's complicated. It's obvious, obviously poetry. That doesn't mean that metaphor is being used. Okay. But at the same time, assume that everything is, is literal is to fail to take, take into account the kind of literature is and wrestle with that. Yeah. We can go to the meaning, but do you still want to add? Uh, yeah. We have a question here first. Uh, yes, please. But all the topics can be open at the same time because we can bounce. Well, the is it's a completely different thing. Hi, I don't know. It's okay, maybe. An, an, <laughs> but don't forget your question now. Huh? Yeah. So, so what is the strong evidence we're fighting against? Like, I'm not talking, I'm talking about uh, from ape to human now. What is the strong So, so, so uh, w when you say fighting against, uh, are, are you talking like the, the, the young earth creationist? Or what, what, what's, the, what's the comparison here? No, no you said that uh, we or some Christians are fighting against the evidence. Yeah, the, the young earth creationist. And I believe yeah. that you were, uh, and my original question also was that, how do you know, like, without presupposing that naturalism is true, because if naturalism is true, then evolution follows. Just, that's inevitable. But without presupposing naturalism, what is the scientific objective evidence that shows that 
we came from apes and not by direct creation of God. I refer you to Wikipedia article which has evidence for evolution which is 120 pages long and has links <laughs> to other articles. So to, to think that there is not mountains of evidence and again you don't need to presuppose naturalism because you can just have naturalism as a hypothesis and that evidence will then show that naturalism is the, is the correct explanation. Okay, one follow-up. Uh, have you read Darwin's uh, Origin of the Species? Yes. And have you noticed how like, he spends a third of the book defending all sorts of difficulties and then he says about the fossil evidence that if you believe this evidence, you will, uh, discredit my, uh, you will discard my theory. That if you I, be, don't I don't remember that part. If you, if you believe, this evi uh, uh, believe this evidence... Well, that's, I'm paraphrasing, but basically he says, if you take this evidence at face value, you will, uh, um, it will be good that you reject my theory or something like that. Well, so, and the evidence hasn't changed. Now, it hasn't changed. I, are you saying he said that if you take the evidence, you will discard my theory? Yes. I, I need book? to check the context of that. It's yes. an empirical question. Yeah. Yeah. But can I follow up quickly? I mean, um, assuming creationism, why has to be Christian creationism and not some other creationism? If we, if we discard, this is a question for Christians now, including you, of course. You know, if we decide to, to trash naturalism, the idea that there is some sort of change so deep that can make us, you know, human from, from whatever we were, you know, why we have to endorse the Christian version of creationism and on some other even uh, religion which don't exist anymore because the believers are being killed by strongest army. Is this a question for me or <laughs> for, for, for everybody, you know, but not for you now because I want to leave the ground. Well, can I, can, I can just a quick, a quick thing, a bit provocation. Well, oh, I'm just, well, you can, I'm just, so why Christian, Christian creation? Well, as a Christian, I believe I, I don't have to borrow from other religions. Uh, Okay, yes, so you can yes. borrow those beliefs. Well, beliefs I think can just be simply check all of them. Like you did that. Yeah, I'm. Um, I actually think you learn the most by finding the smartest person that disagrees with you, and then you can check your biases. And I think there are not so many religions in the world that it is impossible to inquire what are their empirical claims, what are their philosophical foundations. Um, I mean, the major religions is about five, six of them, and their like foundational uh, metaphysical claims are not that many. You can do it reasonably. So I think just look at the alternatives. But there is comparative religion. What I'm claiming yeah. is a contradiction because you want to show what is the religion which is more truthful, instead of the one that we choose to believe to borrow. So in a sense, to decide which one more truthful, then we have to go back to the scientific dimension. And this is called comparative religion. If I understood you... I, I don't understand. I'm, excuse I ask me. you, why, if creationism... Let, let, let's take it as an assumption. So we were not... We are not evolved. We've been created. But since there are many religions, and there were even more before people were starting to killing each other, you know, how do we know, how we decide which version of creationism, don't look at me with that face, oh. <laughs> which, <laughs> which story about creationism is option one, the one we choose to choose because we like it, like a food, you know, I like Italian cuisine, somebody like Chinese, whatever, or cho should we choose the myth that is more, a better chance to be truthful? Yes. And if we choose the truthful option, then we fall back in the um, primacy of science. Is science the only way of truth? Uh, th this is what I'm asking you. It's not. So how do you choose? You can use mathematics, that's not empirical science. How do you choose among available creationist, uh, religious creationist option, which one? You show, you write out their logical trees, mm. you, you try to identify what are their main assumptions, mm. and then you test either the consistency of these worldviews, so Logics, certain... Coherency? Yeah, yeah, so certain worldviews are logically inconsistent. And then you dismiss those? Yes, absolutely. Um, then you go and you check, do they correspond to reality? Do they explain the phenomena we see in reality? Um, I'm not saying this is easy, or even a thing a single person can do, but I feel like some secular guys kind of throw that out of and say, there's so many religions we can never know. Well, 
you can test in a reasonable time frame. Yeah. And then, then, then I want to hear what you think. <laughs> so I don't know if you have any specific creation narratives in mind, but I would just say that like uh, Genesis 1 and 2 presents the creation in, in very broad terms. Like if, if you just want to say that direct creation versus gradual evolution kind of thing. So I don't know if there's, and as Christians, we, we believe that that's scripture, that is inspired writing, so we can trust that. So we don't have to go to see what other religions said necessarily. So that would be uh, one part of the answer. And also, in principle, if, even if evolution look, from microbes to man was true, like there was no one to verify it. Like we, we couldn't really access that. But if Genesis 1 and 2 is inspired writing, then we have testimony from God how, how the <laughs> things happened actually. So we, we shouldn't just discard it as myth or just nonsense, whatever. Uh, please. Are you done? Yeah, let's remember the meaning. <laughs> we, we had the meaning question waiting. Mm. But, but, uh, but I would like to hear your yeah. point of this. Yeah, we, if you look at other creation stories, there are significant differences amongst them. And it seems to me that even if we, we can't sort of give any probabilities, uh, so, so you ha a Hindu tradition that the world over a very, very, very long period of time, millions of years, uh, sort of goes, recycles, and the whole thing goes over again with history repeating itself. I mean, that could be, but to me, that, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to think that there's us here in another cycle, you know, that history is just repeating itself. It seems to me there's too much uncertainty and that this, the world is not going to repeat itself. So, so this Hindu story, the world is just repeating itself over and over again. You'll be back here again <laughs> in this X, X number of years down the road. It seems to me that's, that cyclical view of creation or an eternal universe doesn't very much, make much sense to me. I can't assign a probability to it. But nonetheless, it doesn't seem to have the explanatory power. It doesn't fit nearly as well with what we surround us to think that there actually there was a beginning to the universe. The Big Bang at least points in that direction. Uh, so you can compare them. So just because other religions have different views, as you were saying, you can look at them and see what they actually claim. The, the Babylonian creation story has the world being created out of the dead body of a slain god. right? And when human beings are created, they're created to be slaves of the gods. Well, that sounds like sort of a mythological story of these, these, these gods who are very much like us, wanting the easy road and, you know, sort of the slaughter. And you look, at, you look at Genesis 1, and it's God creating systematically, intentionally. It's good, it's good, it's good, it's good. Now, it's true. I'm much more attracted to the Genesis 1 than I am to the Babylonian one. So maybe that part of the reason why, why it makes more sense to me. Uh, but at least if one sort of is going to trust the religious sources, uh, one needs to look both in terms of what makes sense for myself and also how it fits with the other things one believes. But it's not a hard and fast kind of question. I can't give probability to the, pro the Babylonian creation story. Maybe now it's time. <laughs> hey, I'm sorry, I'm going to make some type of equisyncry to both of you. Might not be a smart question as they hear, but yeah. Um, my question is: uh, Is there a why for both of you? Is is, is there a why for for, for all uh, of the suffering? Is there a why when you have endured so many things and you're still looking for hope, grass from hope? Is the why only that there's going to be a nicer place later, or the why is that I I endure all this pain because I'm scared of hell or? I mean, during all this pain to, to continue existing, energy am, energy will be. I'm just going to do some good dieties through my life, then I die, and I'm energy, and that, that's it. What's the why for you to, of, of living, of enduring pain? Of this is the, the motivation question, which we start the whole thing, but I'm glad that you brought it up, because as I said in the beginning, so why? Well, I'll take the why as sort of a theological question, because the atheists say you have no explanation for why there's so much... Uh, evil and suffering. And many Christians will say, well, the God must have his reasons. We're looking at the underside of a tapestry, hand-woven tapestries, all knots. From the top side, God sees this beautiful tapestry. I think what the Bible tells us from a God standpoint, this world is messed up. So why is this world is messed up? Before the scripture says, it's because the intimate relationship with God, which we initially had, was broken. In addition to that break in personal relationship, there's also a break in the protective relationship. And Satan actually has some influence in this world because of what took place there. Trying to figure out theologically what's exactly going on, I don't have a clear answer to it. But my short answer to why there's so much evil and suffering in this world is because we are no longer under the protective and personal relationship of God, nor the restraining relationship of God, which was there. 
just before the answer, uh, don't mean to be rude. Uh, I probably, I need to paraphrase it a bit more better. Um, more of a why as a purpose, as an individual, as why do you exist? Why do you endure pain? Uh, maybe it's sometimes like that, not like evil. You, you, whatever you call pain, it's not what I call pain. Whatever he calls pain, it's not what he calls pain. But we're of, of a purpose of, 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 of existing, of, of me coming to university, of me studying, of me having a degree, working, having a family, blah, 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 blah. That, that's more of a purpose type of question. Uh, the mean, meaning of life. Meaning of life. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Sh shall I go? Yeah. Yeah, I, I also first didn't understand whether it was a question about the problem of evil, or which is an mm. interesting thing, and we can talk of. But let's uh, focus more on the on the purpose of life. And again, uh, if if I look from the scientific, uh, you know, point of view, our galaxy is one of you know billions of galaxies, and our star is one of the billions of stars and we are on the one small planet, really insignificant in the natural scientific universe. And to be honest, I must accept that, you know, I, 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 that's not a very nice thing to accept emotionally, but that's the conclusion I have been coming to from my studies, my understanding, my rationality. So uh, the, in the grand big scheme of the universe, the, there is no significant purpose for us or this or, or, or me, me as an individual. So what do I have instead? Instead, uh, I think me and, and, and other atheists and humanists, we build our purpose from small things, you know, in our life, like human-sized things. Yeah. So, so they are not universe-sized things, but they might be you know, helping our friends, or taking care of our kids, or, or researching some scientific, you know, theories, or, or being creative, producing some art that might even span, span you know, to the future generations, uh, thinking about the future generations, how, how they might be based on what we have now, trying to make a better world through politics, you know, and, 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 and grassroots activities. So, those are the kind of things that, that we can find, at least try to find purpose on an individual uh, level. And I think they can be valid sources of purpose uh, when we say that, oh, today's teenagers are depressed, you know, because they don't have purpose. I think the problem is that, you know, such teenagers, perhaps they are just focusing on posting, you know, lipstick pictures to Instagram, you know, and, 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 and that level of thing. And that can be a very unhealthy thing, you know, for your meaning of life. But still, you can find better meanings of life from these kind of bigger things than lipstick, you know, but still s smaller things than universe. I wouldn't be so rushed with the youngest because I've done many stupid things in my time. But this, this is the problem of spiritual needs. If the young people are not given decent options, you know, uh, about how to satisfy the spiritual needs, then they might end up doing silly things. Yeah, when you say we can do things for better, for the better ends, for helping people further down, using the term better, one can either say from a scientific standpoint, that's just what my biological, what my values happen to be, but, my, but for me to be motivated to help the next generation that will be around when I'm not here, is I have to believe that actually is better. So how is it that I support this idea actually is better from the scientific standpoint? There is, no, there is no better. And if you don't think there is really any better, then why even say, well, we want truth to, 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 uh, to be victorious? Why should I care about truth being victorious when there's no value in it? There's, I mean, what, 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 what does that matter to me? It doesn't really matter. So I think people actually, atheists bring in belief in better. They use better rather than right and wrong. But better still assumes not just better from my perspective, but actually better. And if they don't actually move this better, it's not going to give them satisfaction what they're doing. And I think it's so important for our own personal happiness that we believe our life is for the better, for the good. But you have to believe there is a good out there, and science doesn't tell us there's any good out there. And I, I need to respond. Yes, I, I really appreciate your poetic mention that humans are just very well organized dust on a dusty planet in the middle of nowhere. Um, but then why should we then care about human rights at all? Why prefer one 
arrangement of atoms over another arrangement of atoms. I mean, everything's just going to the heat death of the universe in any way. And if you look at history, the biggest perpetrators of human rights violations, numbers-wise, were atheistic regimes. So I'm referring to um, communist China and Russia. Um, now, so my question is, why should we care? Because your inner purpose you're talking about, you can find joy um, in making the world a better place. What is better? It's just subjective. Like, why should, um, maybe my better is contrary to someone else's better. And why, like, that's the thing you have in Finland quite, which is very interesting. Like, you're just respecting other people's opinions. But, um, so, yeah. That's my question. But I have to challenge. Empirical evidence shows that actually religious regimes are the most dangerous for human rights, except human rights were invented or established in a time where there was no, luckily, many religious regimes. But the San Holy Mother Church was burning people and death penalty until the 19th century. And the same yeah. number. Uh, well, the, the historical records. There's zeros. You difference. know, the crusades were not invented by atheists. I mean, uh, I have to challenge that. But I think. The empirical truth of your claim doesn't change the importance of the questions. Yeah. So I think we don't want to yeah. uh, deal with yeah. that. Back, and, back. and this is something that you have to, to answer. I think you... Yeah, yeah. So uh, when, I, when I was a teenager and, and uh, there was this Nuorten Post in the Helsinki Sanomat, like a youngster's uh, place, and, and there were many of these kind of uh, born-again Christian teenagers saying how Jesus is lovely and so on. And then I wrote there some atheistic, you know, rant. <laughs> and and then, then somebody, somebody replied to me there, some other teenager saying, you atheist, you know, because you think everything comes down to atoms. So for you atheists, it doesn't matter if you are kicking on the street stones or old ladies. It's the same. Because in both cases, atoms are just moving location in coordinates. Okay, what we call that in philosophy is a straw man, okay? Straw man means you are creating an invalid version of your opponent. A false representation. For, yeah. False representation of your opponent in order to strike it down. So that's a straw man. Why is it straw man? Because 99% of humans actually can agree that kicking stones is better than kicking the old ladies. There is no real contradiction about that if you ask our opinion. Yeah? Yeah. If not for anything else, is that that's what our heart and feelings tell us. And why should we trust it? Well, because science doesn't tell us whether it's better or not, so we, we don't trust science. We trust our, we trust our heart in, in that case. That's true, but no, no, in, no. that can happen with <laughs> religions as well. If I say, okay, I take religion as my standard, whether, who am I kicking? How about if your religion says, go and fly that jet plane, plane against those towers? Yes, let's do that, because my religion says that. So religion is not answering that. If somebody is using religion to override their heart, their heart is saying, I shouldn't kill those people, but the religion says, yes, you should. That's a... That's a bad, or other way around. So, so, you know, religion will not solve that problem. You need to trust your heart anyway, whether it's right or wrong. That's what I claim. Let's, next, please, you, 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 you want to say yeah. something. Right? Yeah, it, atheism has been around in a major way only for the last hundred years or so, okay? So we ask what has come from atheistic regimes, people who are atheistic. You can't, you can't compare the Middle Ages, because after all, before the, everything was religious. And the fact of the matter is that people will do terrible things out of any, any strong ideology, whether it be atheism or Christian belief. At the same time, they'll be strongly motivated to do things which were sacrificial and which they would never have thought of before. And when, when, when atheists say we need to get rid of, rid, rid, rid of religious beliefs, if you get rid of all ideology, then in fact you're getting you're not, you don't have motivation to do what's good. What you need to do is say the problem is not the strength of beliefs, but rather what lies behind them. So you need to go look at Jesus, look at the Christian faith, what's really there? When the first, the Pope who, who sent off the first crusaders to, to liberate uh, Jerusalem, that was the first, that was, that was a church historian said it was the first time he knew of any, any church leader who actually told Christians that God will bless you for killing non-Christians. That tells you how so contrary that is to the fundamental Christian faith and to what Jesus taught. 
So the problem is not that people do terrible things in the name of religion, people do terrible things in the name of atheism, people have strong beliefs and that's a big motivator, don't take away all motivations, but rather get down to what their fundamentals are, what, what is, are, there, are there fundamentals, things which will actually help other people and guide other people. You go to Jesus and you get that. You go to atheism and you get a blank. You, you might, might choose to care for other people, you might not. Atheism doesn't answer that question. I would challenge this because there is something, uh, thanks to uh, psychiatric science, is called psychopath. The person who cannot tell the difference between a stone and an old lady is a psychopath. Yes. So, and, and we know that it's not necessarily evil, it's, it's, it's sick, is a problem, and this is thanks to science. So we usually try to cure these people instead of burning them at stake. But uh, I, please continue. I, I think there are some strong... I would like to hear somebody who hasn't asked question yet. Oh, yeah, please, go ahead. And then that way, okay. Just the last, just the last question for me, I won't bother. Uh, more of, of continuing with the purpose of, of life and meaning and so on. Uh, more personally, I'll, I'll, I'll say, uh, what would you recommend to, to both believe in or not believe in religious or without religion? What would you recommend out of experience, out of life, out of knowledge to do, to try and, and so on, to find a, a, a purpose? Uh, uh, it, it, I know it, it will be broad. I know that purpose is not absolute nor objective. It's subjective to everyone else. Everyone has a different purpose here. But what would you recommend out? You seem very intelligent, both of you, and I, will, I wouldn't mind to hear out what do you think is. And if I go a bit more further, talking about more as a, personally, that ha a person that has experienced life as, as a lot. I, I'm not from here. I've experienced a lot. And both in as just existing, as, as in pain, as things, as, as many things try. Just, sorry, I cannot paraphrase it correctly. Uh, what do you recommend to find a better purpose, or, or just a purpose in life? To find the meaning sorry. of life. Yeah. yeah, let me say that in terms of how we're wired as human beings, close relationships, relationships of trust are very important. A community, that's, that's very important. So a person asks, how am I going to be happier? Well, if you actually are a relatively kind person, and you're relatively honest and caring about people around you, you will be happier in all likelihood than if you're self-centered. But that doesn't tell you what you should do about people you don't like or the people who aren't you. And in fact, human nature is sort of this odd thing. There is this, this caring about people who are like us, but a tendency to demonize people who are not like us and to do terrible things against them. That's also part of human nature. So human nature, if you want to be happy, you'll care about people around you, but it doesn't tell you you should care about people on the other side of the world you should care about. So that's a fundamental question. I, I would encourage people to look at, the, look at Jesus and see if that, you find that actually attractive to you because he calls us to a standard that's extremely difficult for Christians. I mean, who amongst Christians actually loves their neighbor as themselves? But in fact, that's what, God, that's what Jesus calls us to. And for me, that's a wonderful calling for me to be able to stick with that and believe that actually it's the right way because God and Jesus is, is, is telling us that's what we ought to do. And when I make sacrifices in that way, it's going to enrich my life. But from a secular standpoint, even though this motivation would be relatively nice, why should I make huge sacrifices for biological organisms that aren't related to me and who I have some dislike of, whether it be through society or, or other influences? Yes, please. Yeah, so, so I already earlier mentioned, you know, things that a secular person can derive, you know, purpose and, and, and meaning in life. And uh, I, I can still add about this, uh, knowing what is right and wrong. Uh, I, I, I do agree, it's, it's, it's not a universal problem, but, uh, you know, uh, but still the same thing that evolution, you know, gives us uh, some kind of, uh, you know, general... Uh, properties, you know, like we have ten fingers, you know, in our hands and we have two eyes and, and, and we share many physical traits for the same reason we share many traits of thinking, you know, and feeling and, and psychological traits. So it's no wonder that we share, like, like the 95% of us that are not psychopaths, we do share the same kind of definitions that, that you know, feeding the poor is better than, you know, kicking their, you know, uh, and, and, you know, educating people is, is, is better than keeping the rock. So, so it's no, we, we cannot know that these are right or wrong in absolute sense because, you know, there's no absolute sense in this, you know, in a natural worldview, but we can base our actions on this and, and we can trust them because we can see that, that most of humans agree on this. And, you know, there are so many 
problems we could solve already by applying this common sense from the 95% of humanity, there's no need to even, even, even go into the deeper debate, you know, what, what is the 5%. Unfortunately, I must also comment that some ideology claims that if you are poor, it's your fault. So you deserve the miserable state of your finance. Um, maybe things are not black and white, but I think we, yeah. we, we all agree with that. Please. I, I, I must add still that I think that uh, solving the relativistic problem of right and wrong, if you, if you say you are solving it with your religion by God saying this is right and wrong, that's, that's, a, that's a false solution, that's a fake solution, because if God is saying, fly towards the towers, or, or if God is saying, go and kill all those people, I can say, that, that, that's, that's a wrong, wrong advice, you know, the, the God is wrong there, and I'm right when I say the God is wrong, so, so the, the absolute standard fails, you know, because we can identify that some of those instructions are patently evil. It's going to create a storm. Please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I think I'd like to like uh, take the perspective from this like idea that atheism. Uh, there's, it's very difficult to derive like odds from from like uh, that framework. But now, now I'm curious since like uh, at least like this is my very like naive analysis of like when, when we look at like world history. Uh, it, 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 it like very much appears that as we've developed as a society, as like a rationality and whatever, or as a global species, I suppose, ha have like developed. Uh, it, it appears that uh, at least in some sections which have grown more secular, uh, people are living just like at least quality of life standards wise, whatever happiness metrics, whatever you want, like more fulfilling uh, lives. And it appears that like religiousness to some extent is like very much inversely correlated with this sort of a thing. Uh, I, I, and if you look at like historical events, crusades, what, whatever, like I'm just curious, like the, the honest, like sincere, like what, what's the comment of like a very invested religious person on like those horrible events that religions have caused, and then like uh, the fact that secularism tends to be like positively correlated with like just some sort of a life, whatever. I would like to take another couple of questions because we're running out of time and then we leave concluding remarks to our guest if you agree because we, we have to literally leave the room. So maybe <laughs> this gentleman after five, unfortunately, but uh, I'm sure this will continue, right? We will know if and when. No, no, not tonight. Sorry? Can, can we? They're not going to kick us out. Uh, so we stop at five, but this discussion will continue in other such a thing. So we collect the questions now, and then we will give uh, each of you the opportunity to answer to, to each and all of them. This is a very meta, meta and a mundane question. Mm. It's about the movement of Christian apologetics. We've been talking here for two hours, and this has been an all-male panel. All questions were put to you both by men. Is this somehow characteristic for... I understand you travel a lot, Peter having this kind of sessions with people, is it somehow uh, like a, a male phenomenon that we, we as males are here asking the questions? There were three ladies coming, strolling in Four. here. <laughs> Four. Yes, three came in. No, not to count. <laughs> that was my question. Thank you. Next. I think it's more a Finland thing than a apologetics thing. Um, that's my experience in general, but they can... Um, in terms of... Um, meaningfulness and secularism. There's a Finnish guy, I don't remember his name, but he wrote in a New York Times interview about Finland being the happiest country in the world. Mm. And he said there are actually three different metrics. The one is well-being, so lack of discomfort, basically, or subjective contentment. So Finland ranks the top in those surveys. Then there's a measure of meaningfulness. And the surveys actually showed that the most religious countries, people feel that life has the most meaning. So those are countries like Togo, where there's a lot of suffering, like objective, like pain, but they feel like this suffering has great meaning. Um, and then the other one was, the, was with regards to mental health, like if you measure by the least amount of depression. And there again, Finland doesn't rank the top. So it really depends on how you do your survey. Um, Yes, so with regards to that and with the Crusades, um, I would just want to accentuate what our Christian 
friend mentioned here, it took a thousand years for Christians to use theological motivation for violence. A thousand years. And anyone who would say that Christianity in particular, if you zoom in on religions on Christianity, because I think uh, there are religions who say that violence can be God-ordained, I would just disagree with them. Because... But um, in, Christ, in Jesus in particular said, if you live by the sword, you die by the sword. He, when Peter wanted to cut off the Roman's ear. So Christianity does not advocate for violence. Christians have, against their scriptures, advocated for violence. That's just my opinion as a strong religious person. And I agree, but you would be as communicated if you were talking about 600 years ago. There is a blonde lady here that would like to ask a question. I totally agree with you anyway, but uh, okay. some of the leaders... Uh, disagree with us. Thank you. This might be a This is the last just okay. because well good because this might be a stupid question. No, no. <laughs> There's no such a thing as so, stupid uh, question. this is a hypothetical question, but you were saying that uh, because uh, the general population thinks that something is good then that's kind of the standard of goodness. But if like hypothetically ten years from now 60, 70 percent of people start to have cannibalistic tendencies. Is the atheist, atheist perspective then like, okay, let's eat each other, or like, what is the standard of goodness? Is it, does it come outside, <clears throat> as in Christianity it comes from God, or in atheism the general consensus of what is good? Maybe it's a graphic answer since. There is a direct question to you. you. You first concluding remarks, and, and then you will conclude uh, this yeah, session, please. Yeah, we have had historically, you know, places like Nazi Germany, where big amounts of population had been, uh, you know, starting to uh, do horrendous deeds. And, and Hitler was writing that he was thinking he is on the, on the fulfilling God's mission when he is... When he is uh, conducting this war against the Jews because he was thinking Jews are evil. So I think the biggest evils in history happen when there's big groups of people that are, for any reason, whether it's atheistic or, 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 or religious reason, like brainwashed to dehumanize other group of people and say, these are not humans at all. Like they were dehumanizing Jews, you know, they are not real, real humans or, or dehumanizing immigrants or dehumanize something so that our basic evolutionary feelings of taking care of others, you know, they will be shut down, you know, because we are thinking those are only animals and they are not humans at all. So it could happen in the future that, that this kind of uh, uh, significant mind. group of cannibals would somehow rise when they would uh, dehumanize some others, you know, more, in, in, enough. I hope that doesn't happen. And if it happens, I hope there will be a war to defeat them, like there was a war to defeat, you know, the Nazi Germany. Thank you. Yeah, I want to say that ethics, even from an atheist standpoint, is typically not statistics. So if you say parents should care for their children, suppose 1% of parents don't care about caring for their children. Are they doing something which is wrong from a statistical standpoint? Well, 1%, that's 1%. Why is the 99% are right? So, or in the past, when, when women were treated as having less value than men, was that the case? Because after all, that's what the majority of people thought back then, including many women thought that back then. No, actually, most uh, what current Western secular ethics buys in very strongly to the Judeo-Christian idea that every human being is of great worth. And that's why it is that killing other people is a terrible thing from, from a Western standpoint. And I, I think you would agree with killing other people is a terrible thing. But in fact, apart from that influence, if you ask apart from that influence, is the case that the human beings are genuinely inclined towards not killing other people or not killing the people in the tribe next door? Uh, not killing unwanted uh, babies, that kind of stuff. No, this, if that's not the case. So we ask, why is it that, 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 we, that we're at right now? It's because of our Judeo-Christian heritage. If you say, well, let's take away that ladder and nothing will change. No, there has to be a rational justification for why you're willing to spend so much money to reduce the death rate, say, when COVID first hit, even at high economic cost. Why were we in Western countries willing to make that high economic cost? Because we believe that every human being is of great worth. And it's not just simply that most of us are willing to vote on that. So it seems to me that one ought to hope that one has a worldview with which that kind of value can actually be sustained rather than simply being the cultural consensus of the moment. 
Thank you for this, and I would like to conclude on this uh, uh, humanization, the humanization. Maybe Christian and atheist, and maybe other religious people might believe, or non-religious and atheist, that uh, since we are human, we should try to keep the, the human uh, value alive. Like you said, every human life is worthwhile, and we should maybe uh, close this agreeing on that, no matter what our philosophical, <laughs> or, um, cosmological, or religious beliefs are. I would like to thank you very much for this. I hope you put some information on that piece of paper in front of you, because that would help, I think, the organizer to, to move on to the next. Uh, I can only say thank you to our speakers. Thank you. We will know if and when there will be another, uh, another um, opportunity for um, exchange idea. Thank you very much. My suggestion is please disagree. It's much more interesting to talk to people that disagree with us. Otherwise, if we all agree, might be fun for other things, but not for intellectual reasons. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you, Peter.